Hello and welcome back to Pineapple Sports Healing Through Kink online and virtual event. We thank you for rejoining us and a presentation I have been. Oh, sorry, I've just I've re... just think I'm... my speaker wasn't working there. Uh, but we thank sorry, we thank you for rejoining us for our, for our presentations. I hope you really uh, this one I've really been looking forward to. It's going to be presented by Lee Harrington. Lovely, thank you for joining us, Lee. Um, Lee is an internationally known spiritual and erotic authenticity educator, gender explorer, eclectic artist, and award-winning author. <laughs> Today is presents on Kink and BDSM 101. Hi, Lee, how are we doing? Do you want to unsmake? Yes, perfect. There we go. It's a delight to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Well, well, Lee has we had lots of conversations with you prior, and she said that this is one I'm really going to enjoy. So I've been ex it's quite late here because I'm based in the UK, but I've been extra specially excited about it. <laughs> uh, can you let us know a little bit about your books and bits beforehand as well? Because I'm sure people will be interested to know about what, like, where you started. Absolutely. Uh, I'll go ahead and actually, because I'm one of those people that really enjoys having all the pictures. So I'm going to go ahead and show a quick slide because okay. I'm one of those folks. <laughs> what I'll do then, Ali, is might be a bit easier, easier if I actually mute and stop video just because then it'll be less uh, in, images on the screen for everyone else. So what I'll do is I'll leave you to present and, and go with your flow. And thank you ever so much. And I'll pop back in at the end of the hour for you. Wonderful. And thank you, Kelly, for having me here and for everyone nice. at Pineapple Support. It's so meaningful to me because this organization does such great work. And to continue to have everybody who's attending this conference support the work that is happening here is incredibly meaningful for the adult industry and for everyone participating in the attached groups worldwide, right? Thank so. you so, so much. Yeah, the, the more we can do things like this, the more we can get out there, the more people know about us. Anyway, Absolutely. thank you. I'll leave you to the audience now. Thank you so much. So as Kelly mentioned, I have written a few books. Four of them are here on the screen. Uh, Playing Well with Others is about exploring the BDSM kink and leather communities. So if you have people that are looking to explore not just playing and enjoying things on screen or with their uh, co-stars or whatnot, or if people are playing in the bedroom, which are great, but the notion of community, as was brought up in the first presentation today that can help people's mental health, is in that bottom left-hand corner. I have two how-to books on how to do rope bondage in ways that are safer and easier for people who are looking to develop skill sets. And the top two are on the idea of spirituality and sexuality and on exploring transgender experience. I also love cupcakes. Now, before we go into the presentation itself, I want to name that I do come from some points of privilege and some filters that I'm operating my information through. One of them, as Kelly brought up, is that I am coming from the United States, which means some of my vernacular and slang is affected by, and in kink especially, is affected by those communities. I've spent time over in England, Ireland, and some time down in New Zealand and, and uh, Australia, but I do own that if I use certain acronyms or shortening uh, terms, or if I use a concept that you are new to, please in the chat or in the Q&A, let me know so that we can be able to have a conversation about those things. I'm in my early 40s and am queer and white and happen to also myself in my private life be kinky. And some of that came up during my time before my gender transition in the adult film industry as somebody in front of and behind the camera as well as being a sex worker because I was exposed to ideas that would have never happened if I hadn't had coworkers or hadn't had clients who introduced me to new information and new ideas. Before we get going though, I also want to name that this slideshow and the contents of this presentation, some of the material may be illegal in your jurisdiction. For example, in the state of Massachusetts, it's not possible to consent to assault. And so therefore things involving, uh, you know, punching play, floggers, and, and those kinds of actions are arrestable offenses. So if you are doing work in those places, please take some of this information with a filter of your own regional experiences and some countries around the world. You may consider this, some of this information uh, uh, perhaps immoral, 
You may consider it to have some personal trauma involved or historical trauma. For example, when we're talking about power exchange dynamics, words like slave get used. And in the United States, that has is incredibly uh, loaded language when it comes to historical trauma amongst our country and honestly worldwide. Some of these ideas are dangerous, inappropriate, and you might find them unusual or unexpected. So I wanted to kind of plant that ahead of time that if you get exposed to new ideas, that's okay. And so let this be a growing edge. And some of these things, as a note, you might consider Thursday afternoons, so that's fine too. I also ask that every single one of you take care of you because just like consent in our sexuality is important, consent in your attendance is important. Now this is a learning environment. So if you use language that is imperfect or there's an opportunity for growth in how you refer to things, that's fantastic. However, homophobic, racist, ableist and other forms of derogatory language are not welcome here. Uh, part of that ongoing consent also, consent also includes remembering to translate the information you hear into your own knowledge and filters because you are coming from your own excellent life experience. Now, what is this thing called kink? I am using the word kink on purpose and we'll get to that notion in a second, but I use this word called kink because it's a huge umbrella term. It's about voyeurism and exhibitionism, fantasy, role-playing, cross-dressing, uh, authority transfer or erotic power exchange, swinging leather, like it's this huge category. And some people even consider consensual non-monogamy like polyamorous relationships to be kinky while other people do not. Kink is often in the lens of the viewer. And that's important to consider because your average Thursday might be someone else's edge. All right, so keep that in mind. Something you consider day-to-day -day life is someone else's growing erotic edge. So when we're talking about the adult industry, if somebody says, I'm into kinky things, you don't know what that means because that is incredibly personal. Now, I also want to name though, that kink, let's go ahead and make sure that I get pinned here. There we go. Because when there's this other acronym that gets batted around, which is BDSM, bondage and discipline, dominance and submission, sadism and masochism, and sometimes slavery and mastery. It's this acronym that also gets correlated with being kink itself, but as you saw, kink is a lot more things than those six or eight items. So if somebody is into BDSM, they might be referring to that big umbrella of kink, or they might be saying something specific about those acronyms, about that acronym. Now, with SM, sadism and masochism, it's important to know that when we're talking about consensual sadism and masochism, we are talking about something different than what is listed under the DSM, right? The Diagnostic, Diagnostic Statistics Manual, where it's the idea of deriving erotic pleasure or personal pleasure from causing actual or severe harm to others or objects and, th and living things. Now, that is different than somebody who enjoys giving intense sensation and watching intense emotional outcome. And same thing with masochism. The difference between I derive erotic pleasure from true suffering and breaking of my spirit as compared to I enjoy receiving intense emotional, psychological, spiritual experiences and experiencing that to the fullest of it, its extent, wherever my point on a scale might be. So when we're hearing some of these words, I don't know where on a scale someone is somewhere is talking about, right? I've been in the public BDSM and kink community since 1996, and I have met a very small handful of people that might be clinically considered sadists or masochists. And most people I've met are somewhere in the spectrum that I'm referring to. 
However, there is another definition of kink that I have absolutely fallen in love with by the, uh, by the speaker, dancer, and amazing kink educator Z Griss from Embody More Love, which is kink is sexual desires, behaviors, and identities that challenge social approval, giving you the opportunity to explore your courage, shame, pleasure, and liberation. Now for folks who work with, from places in their life that are not necessarily, that come from a place where they are uh, held down in, in society in some way, shape or form, my, my words are coming up challenged. But it, though for those individuals, these realms of kink can be a place for healing and empowerment can be a place where we grow and learn and change by stepping outside of what society thinks is normal and into a place where we are choosing our own life's adventure and facing what society has given us. Now, as a note, somebody mentioned, oh, wrong tab. Sorry about that. Let me go over here and grab this real quick. Somebody mentioned that they enjoyed the definition. So I'm going to go ahead and drop over in the chat information both about me as well as where you can download this PDF for looking at later. Now, when you're exploring kink, there's some common terminology that you, ran, you run into. One of them we've talked about already, which is here, which is the notions of BDSM. Now, the next ones though, it's a quick list, is the idea of top and bottom, the people doing the action. For those of you who are working in the gay film industry or for those of you who are yourselves gay, bisexual, or men who love men, be aware that top and bottom are also be ab about the fucker and the fucky, but this applies in kink as well, the doing action. Dominant and submission, dominance and submission is about power who is having control and who is surrendering control. But your person you're talking to might say, I'm a submissive and what they mean in these terminologies is that they're a bottom. So finding out when someone uses their, these terms, what do they mean by it is important, right? You also hear people talking about the notion of a switch. These are people who enjoy things on both or many points. This is not a, a binary, right? Where one person is one role and one person is another. It's a whole spectrum of potential play and enjoyment. For example, if two people are interested in wrestling, who's the top and who's the bottom and doesn't matter, right? Or is everybody here a switch? It's all about personal identity as compared to behavior because behavior is where we start looking at the notions of consent. I love Planned Parenthood's definition here. And, as you, and coming up later in this conference, there's gonna be more conversations around consent. But I wanted to plant this construct that consent is freely given, right? It's not coerced. It is reversible, i.e. if somebody's on drugs or alcohol where they can no longer reverse their original decision, it becomes challenging to debate whether it was consensual. Was it informed? If you said you were going to spank someone, did they have a story based on porn or have they been spanked before or have an idea of what that's going to look like today? It's enthusiastic. That doesn't have to mean, wee, that's so amazing. It just means that it's an actual buy-in rather than, uh, I don't know, right? They're different things. And specific means that I have consented to this activity tonight, but not forever. And I have consented to this activity not all activities, unless in some cases people have relationships based on that. Now, fetish is another word that you might have heard that comes up as well. Um, and I'm not sure what the terminology for the various um, manuals uh, for therapists in ver other countries, but you'll hear the word um, paraphilia used in discussions of, of fetishes that are potentially debilitating. Fetishes I think of as a bonus to one's eroticism. If these materials or objects or a body part is, or is involved or an action like smoking or laughter or crying, if these things are involved, there's a higher engagement, but they may not be literally required. 
Are there some people who are kinky for whom it is a required sexual included activity or object to be able to have arousal or desire? Absolutely. But as I mentioned with spectrums, there's a lot of spectrums out there. Voyeurism and exhibitionism is the notion of enjoying watching and enjoying showing. Now for some people, that's the idea of the titillation of perhaps the tease that comes of peering at someone through a window or peeping through a hole at a bathhouse. Now that's different than being perhaps at a swingers club and having somebody who's in a corner masturbating watching a group of people. Again, this is a spectrum and it's worth considering if you're talking to someone and they say that they're a voyeur, is this something that is a non-consensual peeping Tom situation? Or is this a, I enjoy watching porn on a regular basis, but it's not affecting my other relationships. Where are these things on a spectrum when we're having conversations, right? Where are we at in these dialogues? Because as I mentioned, this stuff is a spectrum and there's no right place to be, but it's worth considering the person you're talking to, are they vanilla, right? Someone who has not explored some of these topics. And I know some people use uh, vanilla in a almost a derogatory way, right? But I will remind people that vanilla is a spice we have literally gone to war over and the world is currently having a worldwide vanilla shortage. So um, for some people, they are curious or they're exploring it and other people are outright getting freaky on a regular basis. Again, no right way, or they might be really super freaky and turned on by some things and vanilla in others. These are not binaries. Now, one thing that I mentioned that for some people is kinky and for other people it isn't, is what's considered diverse, diverse non-monogamies or CNM, consensual non-monogamies. And it's plural because there's a thousand different ways to be consensually non-monogamous. For some people, this is polyamory, having multiple loves that may or may not involve sexual partners. For some people, this is swinging, having multiple sexual partners, whether for one night or as ongoing relationships, but may or may not involve romantic or uh, platonic love in some way. For some people, it's slut dumb. And this note says the difference between consensual, i.e. all parties know knowing that, uh, that people get a little bit slutty and freaky on the weekends, or is it that somebody is going behind someone else's back, which can be considered a form of cheating? Now, I mentioned here the joke about the mysteries of monogamy because I've met people who, for example, in the porn industry refer to themselves as monogamous because they have one partner, but might have different people they work with on camera because there is a difference between identity or relationships and sexual behavior in the same way that there are men who consider themselves heterosexual or straight, but are considered on the down low, i.e. receiving sexual pleasure with or for other men because they enjoy the sensation of the activity, not because it's about romance or identity. So this goes back to discussing the difference between identity and behavior. And what does someone you're talking about mean by these things? Where are they coming from? And as a note to remind people, if you have things that are coming up for you, if you wanna drop it in the chat or there's also a Q and A button at the bottom of your screen, feel free to do that. You are more than welcome. Now, the next one I wanna point out is this idea of, uh, you know, the idea of conscious power dynamics. Now, in the world at large, power dynamics are everywhere. We have a power dynamic with the grocery store clerk because they have to treat us respectfully or lose their job and lose their home. Power is at play all the time. But especially for people who are queer, who are people of color, who are sex workers, the power of choosing when they engage in power dynamics and actively buying into any given role, whether in the bedroom 
or as a lifestyle and the whole spectrum in between, because just because you're in kink doesn't mean it's your lifestyle. Choosing these things is profoundly different than being forced into them by society. And there's a wide variety. For some people, it's for one scene or erotic encounter. And for other people, it's an ongoing and regular part of their life and how they operate within their sexualities. The next is the notion of sex magic or what gets called sacred kink. This could include people who do tantra, individuals who embed their eroticism in their mysticism, people who I, I joke here about guilty gluttony, that I used to be part of a group that refers to itself as enjoying sinning, repenting, and repeating. For some people, their spirituality is intrinsically involved in their sexual practices. And for other people you enc will encounter, it is in direct opposition and they will be working with the realities of their own life's journey of how do they feel about the fact that they have a se uh, sexuality or various kinks that perhaps their faith that they follow might be not in alignment with. So to be aware of that, and when somebody says, you know, I'm working with both my spirituality and my sexuality, we don't know whether those things are in union or potentially in opposition or in uncertainty and conflict. For example, I met a Baptist couple down in Louisiana who had been actively kink shamed by the kink community and faith shamed by the kink communities because they were Baptist. And they said, we don't have public sex. We are a monogamous couple. We enjoy showing up at parties to get turned on and titillated and have fun. Go home and enjoy each other's bodies as God intended. And then the next morning, go to church with our children. We do not know the relationship between someone's faith and someone's kink. And so we're talking about kink 101 to not, with all of these things, to not make assumptions, right? Have this be authentic to the person in front of you. Now, first, I love this comic. Second, you'll hear the notion out there of safe words. Safe words might be a red, yellow, green. Red meaning stop. It could be stop this activity or stop everything. <coughs> uh, it could be yellow is pause or yellow means I need you to check in with me. And green means go. I love this. Safe words could also be a term that you hear when it is um, you want to stop the action that is happening with using a word that's not coming up in your role playing. Because if some people want to be able to say help, help, no, no, because they're role playing some sort of thing that is uh, looks like consensual non-consent or struggle play, ravishment, eroticism, which can be incredibly healing for some people. But in those situations, they need a word like zebra or zebra that isn't going to come up in the middle of most erotic encounters. Now, safe words are a 201 level skill set in a lot of ways because 101 is using a shared language, i.e., my shoulder hurts, or please stop that, or I need this to end right now, or hey, can we talk for a while? That's more of a 101 skill set. And so if you have someone who's exploring kink, to have a conversation around how are you having communication styles in the middle of your encounters with a partner or with a group of people for who, if people enjoy things like gangbangs or different forms of group sex, right? Like what is the communication systems that are at play? Now, the next one that I really look at when we're talking about kink and health and kink and healing is the question around is kink, is something kinky or is it abuse or abusive behaviors? And I ask this thing when we talk about power and culture, Fifty Shades was only romantic because he was a billionaire. If he was living in a tra trailer, it would have been called a Criminal Minds episode. And I see this happen time and time again, where the power of classism and the power of pretty pri privilege and the power of all of these things affect how people are seen as whether something is abusive or not. 
It's why in the porn industry, we've seen situations happen in the last five years of individuals who were working in the industry who weren't believed that somebody else could have been abusive because they were seen as so loving and part of the active part of community, et cetera. But to look at the details of what is considered abusive behavior, though note that activity and outcome are different things. A consensual punching, and I'm using punching as an example because it can resemble domestic violence, a punching on the chest that is symmetrical that causes intense sensation, a rhythmic experience can be pleasurable even if to an outside viewer looks at violence. The joke that a friend of mine who does trainings for hospitals says is that most domestic abuse is not symmetrical and most SM is. And so to check with someone when they're talking about being, quote, forced into situations, was it agreed to? Was it consensual? And just because it was agreed to, does that still make it okay six months, six years later? And to have those ongoing assessments for ourselves, for the people that we're working with, for our friends and partners, right? To ask some of these questions. Now, the next thing that I really like to examine is that what does someone know and what do they offer? Just because I meet someone who has what gets called a big toy bag doesn't mean they have any skills concerning the things they own. Just because somebody has a title, even in a public community or online, doesn't mean they know how to do things and doesn't mean they're a responsible partner in dominant and submissive dynamics. All I know is that they own things or have a title. And so I like to ask people about questions of what are your partner's skill sets? How long have they been doing that thing? What's their practice level? Have they been in the quote scene, which is a slang for the BDSM public communities? And I say communities because every community around the world and even sub community has a different energy because of different people running it, different standards of behavior, different social norms. Because if somebody says, oh, I've been doing this for 20 years, if they've been doing it once a year for 20 years, it is different than somebody who might have been studying five times a week for one year and has immersed themselves in a skill set or in a culture. Next thing I consider is, is your play sexual? For some people, their play is entirely sexual. All they do, all of their kinkiness is entwined with their erotic and sexual practices. For other people, they enjoy going into an altered state of consciousness pleasurably, powerfully, consensually as a way to enjoy connecting with themselves and their bodies, which is different than what was discussed earlier of the idea of being evasive or looking at um, dissociation from one's life and trauma. But for people who are consciously and, and actively choosing to go on those journeys may have nothing to do with their sex lives. So asking someone, hey, when you are talking about kink, do you like doing kink and then sex? Sex and then kink? Kink and sex? Or kink and sex? And with all of those things, what does sex even mean to you? And when you're saying kink, what does kink mean to you? And to not assume that we, when we know these words, we know what we're talking about. I have somebody who's in my world, for example, that wearing a strap on and penetrating someone else is considered kink to them, but not sex. Because sex for them is about erotic intimacy. And for them, the idea of using a strap on on someone else is about power. So teasing these things out can be really useful. And for some people, it's even useful to explore why are, do you consider one thing sex? Why do you consider one thing kink? Where did these come from? And for other people, they enjoy the pleasure of it. And untangling those things may not even have a result of where it came from, while for others, it has a specific origin point. Neither of those are better or worse, but sometimes for some people, it is worth examining. Now, let's say you've decided to get freaky or kinky. 
right? You've looked at all of these concepts. We haven't gotten to what you're going to do in it. But I want to plant this notion of how many of these erotic encounters, also known as scenes or a scene, not to be confused with the scene, right? A scene, the scene. So be aware which one people are talking about. So in a scene, I think of it like theater, right? Lights come on, you do the things, lights go out. Think of it like a theatrical scene. For some people, these scenes are incredibly well scripted. Think of it as Shakespeare. For other people, it's improv theater. There's a whole bunch of props, you know, theater props down on the ground. There's two or seven people who have been doing, are trained and practiced doing theater improv for an extended period of time, but now can go and have fun on stage. Again, neither better or worse. But when we're talking about creating these scenes, are all players on the same page? Because if one person thought they were showing up with what they'd talked about for Shakespeare, and the other person thought, oh, Shakespeare's the theme that we're starting out with, but then we're grabbing our theater props and going for it for the next two hours. Where are we coming from in our negotiations and setting up our encounters for success? Now, I call them a ride, right? So the ride or a scene, right? Often involves negotiation, talking about using checklists or figuring out some of the things that might happen or all of the things that might happen. Foreplay, the things leading into the action that for some people is the point of the thing in the same way that for sexual eroticism, for some people, the entire point of it is the foreplay, also known as the warm up. Warm up can also be a form of ramping up types of experiences. For example, starting out with soft petting that leads then to a flogging that then leads to something and building up a ramp up. For some people, it's about the roller coaster. Instead of it going one, two, three, 12, or starting at 12 and then dropping back down, perhaps they like one, two, three, back down to one, up to seven, back down to one. Everyone enjoys these things differently. Some people also have a pinnacle moment. This is the moment that we've all been waiting for, considered, uh, for example, in the industry as being the cum shot moment, all right? Not needed by everyone, but for some people, there is that moment. Cool down, cuddling and aftercare, with aftercare being literally anything that somebody wants after the scene. That's all it means. In some versions of encounters, we see this be cuddling, we see this be a, a fuzzy blanket. We see this be food brought to people and taking care of our bodies with water and food is really important. And if you're having these encounters happening on set, please consider was a producer thinking ahead of time about that because it could be an uncaring relationship that your client's working with or your friend is working with or you are working with if these aftercare needs for your body aren't taken care of. Now. Checking in is also really important because how are we doing directly afterwards or talking about it three or four days afterwards, including how do we have it be even more fun next time? Now, I mentioned before that kink is not legal everywhere. There was a case recently where a um, non-monogamous group of individuals with a male dominant and female submissives have been arrested for having uh, running a house of Ill, uh, for running a uh, for owning human chattel under the slave clauses in Australia. Now, with that being the case, it is important to look, especially for lifestyle individuals, whether what they are doing is legal and how do they feel about those things, or is it abuse? And in fact, we were looking at the human chattel laws in play because the person either felt like they couldn't or in fact could not leave that situation. So I think it is worth looking at your local jurisdictions and for people who are traveling to different places, what are the issues at play in your local areas? Because it is different everywhere. And just because something is legal doesn't make it individually moral or ethical. And these things intertwine with each other. So to sit with those notions, I think of in Utah, for example, it is legal to engage in um, active physical activity that involves pain with somebody who is consenting. 
and it is legal to wear an unusual costume, but it's not legal to wear an unusual costume while engaging in pain. The reason for this was the ability to control and still allow, I should say, Christian domestic discipline within certain marriage structures, but outlaw dominatrixes. So to look at these things creatively and who is at play and how does it affect local communities as well as people who are working in various sex industries. Now, now we're gonna get into some activities that people do in this world called kink. And I'm gonna remind people as we're going that if I go past a notion or you're like, whoa, what did that word even mean? Please let me know because sometimes I unconsciously use slang. The first notion is bondage. This might be things uh, involving floor work or aerial work. It might involve rope or leather, rubber vacuum beds where people are sealed inside with breathing spaces out the top, mummification either done with full wrappings or with cling film could be silk scarves or metal cages and stocks and furniture and mental bondage, which is literally being told, sit in that corner. For some people, bondage is about feeling safe, secure, held. For other people, it's an ordeal, a challenge, push me to the edge. For others, it's about, I want to be made beautiful, artistic, sculpted and decorated are all partners on the same side with our whys, or at least aware and finding compatible places for the why they are doing this. Because if one person shows up thinking they're being made into a sculpture and the other person thinks they're showing up for a pain-based encounter and challenging someone's body, we might have a situation that even though we negotiated, it might turn into a, um, into a violation of one's consent because of miscommunication. The next category is impact play. Anything that causes impact upon the body. Now, one example of this is caning, which are thin to thick sticks that leave strikes and lines across the skin. This can be uh, incredibly physically challenging for some people and for others, a soft buildup. Another is spanking right? To use a closed hand or open hand to be able to put impact on different parts of the body. Paddles, floggers or, fla or flails, which are tails of leather attached to a single stalk. It could be a whip of some sort. There's a wide variety of impact tools, including, as I already mentioned, fists. Now with all of these and with bondage, marks can be left behind. Even if we thought we were being careful, and so as part of negotiation and conversation, finding out, especially say if somebody does dance work and has to work the pole this coming weekend, what are our risk factors for this activity of potentially leave, leaving marks? Because this is a part of negotiation that some people don't see on the various checklists you can find on the internet or in the back of Playing Well With Others, my, my white book there. And it doesn't always get thought about. So I encourage people, especially if you're talking with people in these industries, if you have someone who's sharing about those things and says, my partner keeps leaving marks and I'm so mad about it, where is the line between shit happens and my partner is doing non-consensual behavior that I've asked for change around and perhaps I and this person need to have different conversations than where we're currently at. Not better or worse, just worth looking at when we're having some of these conversations. Now, as I mentioned before, pain is this complex thing because pain has become an enemy in our culture and in our world at large. If we are working at Walmart, we are expected to stand on concrete for eight to 10 hours a day and not complain about it, right? Checkout clerks not being allowed chairs to sit on in the United States, which never made sense to me because all over Europe you can have, you can sit on a stool, who cares? It's fine. But pain has become our enemy and we're expected to take pills and ignore it. So if we look at pain that is consensual and we've agreed to it, it can be a powerful thing indeed. For example, both physically and psychologically, like psychologically and emotionally empowering, I have a friend of mine who has fibromyalgia, 
who has chosen to engage in intense physical pain play on occasion because she can consent and stop at any time those intense sensations, which is very different than living with her long-term disability where she experiences pain on a day-to-day -day basis. And this becomes an incredibly healing tool for people with disabilities, which kink in general and the idea of choosing your own erotic adventure is a huge thing for a variety of disempowered populations, especially people with disabilities, I would argue. As long as we are not infantilizing, I should say, people with disabilities at that time. Now, pain play can involve piercing. This is often done with very thin gauge needles that are all done in a clean and prepared way to minimize risks of infection. And it's done very shallowly in most cases to not cause damage to nerves, veins, etc. Clips and clamps, such as these clothespins that are shown in this image are an example. Trampling or pressure points which is worth considering learning about the human anatomy to find out what is safer to do. Now, with all of these things, learning about activities is really important because even though it's impossible to have things be truly safe, minimizing risk of harm is so important because having those violations, I've seen situations happen where people who were untrained or unaware or stopped caring in the heat of the moment have caused serious harm to others. Um, CBT is a slang for, for, I was about to say cognitive behavioral therapy, but that's different. Uh, cock and ball torture or torment. Uh, torture in this case being consensual. Electricity, we are not talking about things that go through the heart or through other things that could cause harm to the body. We are talking about surface level pieces or things that might twitch one's limbs. Uh, and then struggle and resistance play or knives, sharps, and weapons. Be aware that if we are looking at anything that resembles violent tools in our culture, and we are looking at the mental health of ourselves or our partners, I have seen people do play with, play with knives and then have someone else who's experienced PTSD surrounding weapons go into places that are unhealthy for all partners involved. So if you have awareness with anything we've talked about already that can bring up some emotionality or emotional activation and or these things that affect mental health, it is worth considering whether you wanna share that with a partner, how you wanna process that, or do you even wanna open that back up? For some people, kink is a great way to have a slow exposure therapy. But remembering that kink is not therapy, it is a therapeutic tool used by some people. And I have found a number of individuals who are, they are doing that thing consciously can partner up with a therapist or a coach or with someone else that is trained in these issues so they're not going blindly into these topics because I have also seen people re-traumatize themselves or vilify a partner reassigning past trauma onto new partners and lovers. So I tried very carefully on those issues and topics. Now the next topic, which is such a broad thing that gets used by people without even considering being kinky all the time is the notion of sensation play playing with sensations. This could be stroking someone's body with feathers or fur. It could be temperature, such as this candle that's being shown. And candle wax like this looks really intimidating. But if it's made out of soy or paraffin, that's the stuff we dip our feet and hands in at a spa, right? That is what's used for massage candles. And so it looks intimidating. And this is very different than using dangerous technologies like beeswax which can leave permanent scars on people's bodies. This again goes back to, has someone looked into what is say fur? Suction cup devices, also known as cupping devices, uh, or if we're talking about using cock pumps as well. Wet and messy play is talking about wrestling in jello, all the way up to people who enjoy baked beans or other food play or playing with slime in some way, shape or form. Tickling. For some people that's soft and sexy and for other people that is sadistic, bordering, bordering on non-consensual 
based on childhood traumas around people often being forced to be tickled even though they said no, leaving behind those childhood wounds. Blindfolds, for some people, cutting off a sense of the body can amplify other senses. Shaving, having someone else shave them. Massage, I love being a massage bottom. Having somebody else massage me, other people might, might not be considering kinky, but if I ordered someone to massage me, I have now created a scene where I get to relax and be massaged. Is it kinky or not? This goes back to self-definition. And for some people, I've met folks who are like, I'm not kinky, but I am totally signing up for that massage. That sounds fantastic. This next category can be really complicated, especially in the adult industry, which is the issue of body fluids. Golden showers are the idea of playing with, and in some of these things, it's on the body. For some people, it's in the body. For some people, it's oral consumption. For other people, it is smelling these things, interacting with them, or having to do the activity on or with themselves or with someone else. For example, in golden showers, it could be peeing on someone, or it could be wearing a diaper and sitting in your own fluids whole range of stuff with urine. Spit, sweat, cum, blood and menstruation, lactation, enemas, and scat. Now, I say it's complicated in the adult industry because there are so many individuals where playing with cum, such as cum swapping or having cream pies is part of the encounter and the agreement within what you're doing in videos. However, I, I mentioned that it is complicated because how we do these things recreationally will affect our work. And this goes back to coercion too. If we have someone in our world who has been coerced on set to say, oh, come on, it's not, I mean, you're already fucking bareback. What's the issue with getting a cream pie from these guys too? This goes back into, was it consensual or is somebody already in an altered state of consciousness based on power for the need to be able to get a paycheck to say yes? Or we'll give you another $300 if you're willing to do it and that person needs to pay rent. The lines around power and all of the stuff we've talked about becomes tricky in some situations. So it's not just altered states of consciousness based on where you are in a scene, it's also about coercion based on power, including the issue of money. Now, the next one that we come into crosses over into that body fluids for some people. There are other people who would get considered 100 percenters, which is dental dams, gloves, uh, condoms for anything that involves body fluids in any way, shape or form, including not kissing on bare mouths because of concerns around transmitting various oral STIs, whether it is everything from COVID-19, which is an orally contractable STI. So I'm just gonna say that through to anything from herpes to gonorrhea, et cetera, because these are transmittable for oral um, thrush in different forms. So this next category I was going to though was around sexual play and that is not the button that I wanted. Fantastic. All right, there we go. Now sexual play can start with the notion of body fluids or body worship, I should say, which is licking and kissing up and down someone's form. It could be around how someone interacts with a vulva or vagina, uh, vulva being the external interaction of the body or vaginal play, the inside uh, penetration. Could be about cock and balls, anal. Could be about sexual service, right? Let me provide pleasure for someone else. It could be around what gets considered, quote, forced encounters. This could be role playing where somebody gets to say no, no, no. Or for other people, it's the notion of forced by. This is especially seen in uh, uh, professional domination where there are heterosexual men who want to explore having sexual encounters with men but don't want to change their identity and so role playing involving being forced into an erotic encounter with this with this person allows for plausible deniability through the relationship with a woman. Could be with multiple partners, medical scenes, some people consider this more on the pain play area or the body float, but these things all cross over to each other, right? And this last one, chastity and orgasm control. 
which can be everything from you're not allowed to orgasm to me ordering someone to orgasm. So I think it's important when we're looking at this wide array of activities that are physical, what is it that we're wanting to do and what on the scale? Because if somebody says, I'm really into hardcore SM, I have no idea what they mean, right? So asking them what they mean by these various words. Now I've got just a little bit left, so I'm gonna scroll through some of this efficiently and you can look at this power plot later. Role play is another category. This can be an array of things that involves gender or animals or role playing with activi activities or race, religion, and his history. Make sure everyone knows that we're role playing, not that I'm actually consenting to do, for example, with age play, it, all of the people are adults over the age of 18 pretending to be children. That is not the same, for example, as doing anything with someone who is under the age of 18. That is not role playing everyone over the age of 18 is role playing. Psychological play is everything from dirty talking to phone sex and hypnosis, calling somebody good boy, good girl, good monster, right? High protocol is types of ways people deliver their service relationships. And mind fucks are role playing scenes where one or more people don't know it's a role playing scene. So con consider, are people interested in this? And currently, if with stay-at-home uh, orders there's an, and people who work as cam girls and cam guys, psychological play is a great place to be able to encounter uh, and interact with clients. Other ideas I've seen out there, recording you know, homemade videos are a great example. Outdoor or quote, public play. This goes back to the crossover between what's legal and what's ethical or moral. And I have on here breath and blood flow control, right? Strangulation or, or ordering someone to breathe. This goes back to the notion that some of these things are very dangerous and people have died from some of these activities we're talking about today, which is why we need to assess our risk profile. Everyone will have their own. What are your soft limits, right? Things you're willing to try if it feels okay and we're in the moment and hard limits. I'm not willing to talk about this. If we want to renegotiate, it's on a different day at a different time, if then. And if we're looking at it psychologically, some people's um, risk levels and risk assessments are not based on physical risk. They are based on emotional responses from past trauma. That's not good or bad but it is worth looking at whether that person wants to change it. That is not about a partner saying, what's wrong with you? Why haven't you dealt with this? I'm not that person. It's about the notion of acknowledging a partner or a friend and saying, wow, how are you feeling about that? Do you want to look into it and play with it? Um, and everyone has their own comforts and levels and to find out where everyone will have joy, where everyone will thrive rather than what people will put up with. And to do all of this, it's about communication and flirting and sharing ideas. For some people, it's checklists, right? Let's go through it. Are you okay with this? Not okay with this. Kink.com, for example, has a great example of this on their kink intake forms. When people are doing uh, various SM videos, how do you feel about this? Yes, no, etc. And there's yes, no's and maybes on every single one. Actually, I think on there, since it's a legal contract, it's simply yes, no but have formal negotiations. For some people, it's dirty talking. Maybe it's sharing websites with each other and discussing what's hot about that for you. What are you interested in? Munches are slang for people getting together to talk about kink, but not do any of it. Whether these are online munches or when they happen again in person, whether they are happening in oftentimes uh, coffee shops or restaurants or bars. And then also places like this, classes, conferences, because you have two or three people that all went to the same class, you now have something to talk about afterwards. Play parties, again, are places that people gather together um, and are sometimes referred to as dungeons or dojos or, hook, or um, a lot of other slang out there. And when we talk about the communities, again, noting that they're all different, be aware that you might run into symbols like this. So if you have somebody who comes in and is wearing a flag like this or a Triskelion that looks like um, a yin yang symbol, but with three parts, these are two different ways people are saying non-verbally, I'm kinky and I'm open to talking about it subtly. 
not publicly necessarily, but subtly. And if you see someone come in, they might be trying to see if you know what they're saying. And a lot of people also are not using their legal names because of jurisdictions or concerns about how they'll be outed. And so they use what's called scene names. If somebody is concerned and their mental health issues right now are affected by um, concerns around outing, asking them how they're managing their social and online hygiene, right? Are they using different computers? Are they call coming in with different names, et cetera? How are they protecting themselves online? Because it is a real issue. Because with all of that, it's about consent. It's about getting spicy and freaky and having some fun being kinky right? Enjoying yourself and finding it the way that you want to be. And everyone's going to be a little different. So figuring out what your path is, if you're working with clients or you have friends or people that you're talking to, finding out what they mean by those conversations. If you're talking with a partner, where are we coming from? And this these are just a series of 100 plus ideas. And all of these have subcategories. So my hope is that people have learned a little bit more about getting freaky, about getting kinky, and about exploring BDSM. And I'm really grateful for the folks here at um, Pineapple Support for letting me come in and talk about these issues and hopefully set people up for some deeper conversations over the next two days as you're exploring further how to look at BDSM as a healing tool because you've got a deeper and broader exposure to some of these ideas. So thank you so much. Hi, Lee. Thank you. Oh, my God. Leah was completely correct. It's such a well-constructed and thoughtful presentation, not only in your content, but also in, in, your, in your awareness of your wording. You know, it, 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 there's not many people that can hold a, on my attention for, that, for a solid hour. <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> and I've just been sat here like this going, yes, love oh, it. No, it's, it's because of the cookie and the milk. Like... <laughs> I, when I saw yeah. that cartoon, I broke down laughing. I'm like, oh, that. I did. I mean, your, your cartoons with, with uh, uh, one of the comments earlier on was that you use humor in your in your presentation. And I think that it brings a lot more awareness to people because it lightens it rather than it being so, so, so intense. But I think the key basis of everything, isn't it, is just to have a discussion beforehand. Have it, make sure that you, you're aware of your boundaries and everything. But I have, look, we've got some of the comments here. I've never heard anyone talk about both kink and face. I mean, uh, thank you for that. Absolutely incredible. So grateful for your time and energy. You have been brilliant. And what a way to end our first day. <laughs> it's been yes. a delight and it's such an honor to get to follow after the people who were talking this morning. Uh, and we've, hopefully in the future, getting to see the person who sadly had to cancel today. I was really I looking forward to that. But there's such great content over the next two days. And I hope people come back tomorrow and on Thursday to keep tuning in and learning more. Thank you so much. Well, we, we, are, we will be here. And tomorrow we start with Justine Cross, which is on your knees, power and submission, which is uh, <laughs> it's going to be another good one. It said, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone else. I'll let you go now, Lee, and I'll say my final farewells to everybody. So thank you ever so much. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to drop one more time before I go over in the chat yes. um, where people go can down, get my information and also download the PDF for today. So if you want to have this as a jump off conversations with the people around you, with clients, with producers who are shooting porn with you, whatever it might be. You I have am one that has already downloaded it. <laughs> I love it. All right, I'll let you go. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so Take much, care. Lee. Take care. Have a good day. Right, guys, thank you so much for joining us. And like I say, it's the, it's the end of today. However, we'll be back at 3 p.m. EST tomorrow for Justine Cross, Power and Submission on Your Knees. Um, and we'll, again, thank you to our sponsors, kink.com, loyalfans.com, shinybound.com, Eclipse for Sale, and Feet for Cash. Um, obviously, we are indebted to our sponsors and our presenters for allowing us to bring to, to excuse me to bring together these events for you if you've any queries or questions you can always contact us directly or if you want any further information on pineapple support, support specifically you can go over to pineapplesupport.org thank you ever so much I hope you have a lovely evening and we'll see you tomorrow bye bye before you, uh, I know you've ended stuff, but I don't know if you saw in the Q and A there was a quick question about will people have access to the recording? Oh yes, sorry, yes, okay.
tomorrow we, uh, we will be having three days of the events and then what we will be doing is we'll be uploading them to our YouTube channel at a later date. It won't be immediately, but we will be sharing it all to our uh, to all the presenters as well, who will also be able to share them on their websites. And I hope that's okay. Thank you for that, Lee. You've got a better eye than me. <laughs> Have a great day, everyone.